Greetings. Uh, welcome to Electronic Circuits 1. I am Bezad Rozavi and this is lecture number 40. Today we will spend some time looking at the common gate topology, another amplifier topology that is used in some applications. Before we go there, let's take a look at uh, what we covered last time. Uh, we saw that uh, in the, for biasing the common source stage, we had different approaches. The idea was to create a certain DC voltage at the gate that allows the device to be on and carry the required current. So, for example, we can use a simple resistive divider attached to the gate to establish that DC level. Or uh, we can have that resistor connected to the drain and create a self-biased stage. We saw that we ended up with uh, this type of biasing for the simple common source stage or with the generation. And then another possibility is to have this resistor tied between the gate and the drain. We saw that this has a bit of self-correction ability in terms of uh, when <coughs> temperature and process, etc., vary, uh, whereas this one was more sensitive. We also saw that in some cases we have to use a capacitor because the preceding device or, or stage may disturb this bias voltage. Uh, so either th this circuit and the preceding circuit have to be designed uh, as one entity or their biases have to be separated, isolated by a capacitor. All right, we also took a brief look at the common gate stage. Uh, this stage is defined as one whose output, or whose input is applied to the source of the transistor and whose output is sensed at the drain of the transistor. And then we have some sort of load between the drain and the supply voltage. And then uh, the gate voltage has to be biased. For now, we just connect a battery to it. So from our simple qualitative analysis last time, we saw that if the gate, if the source voltage goes up, uh, the drain voltage also goes up. So we expect that the voltage gain of the circuit is positive, not like that of the common source stage. So today we'll uh, uh, dig deeper into the common gate stage and look at the small signal properties and then its bias design. So let's begin and look at uh, the small signal properties. As usual, we are interested in three primary quantities, uh, namely the voltage gain, the input impedance, and the output impedance. Okay, so we want to uh, look at the voltage gain. We start out with the circuit in its simplest form, as I showed you just now. And uh, we apply a voltage source at the input. This is our input voltage source. We call it V in. We are interested in V out with respect to ground. So V out and then we have a resistor here. We assume that channel length modulation is zero, so lambda is zero, and we proceed and draw the small signal model of the circuit. Starting from here, we keep this voltage source, that's our input small signal voltage source, so V in. Then I need to draw the small signal model of this device. Now I will draw it as we have in the past, meaning with the gate on the left and the drain on the right. Even though in this drawing, I have the gate on the right and the drain on the left. It's not a big deal, but it's easier to do it that way. So we have the gate, the source, and the drain. So here we have V1 as the small signal gate source voltage. Then here we have GMV1. And we see that the input goes to the source. So the input goes to the source. Uh, the gate is at AC ground because this voltage source has zero change with time. So this gate is connected to ground. And then the drain goes to a resistor that goes to the power supply. The power supply has zero change with time. Therefore, that's also AC ground. So that resistor goes from here to AC ground and we are interested in this output voltage. <coughs> that seems like a simple circuit. As usual, we would like to eliminate V1 and find V out over V in. 
Uh, well, it just happens that in the circuit, V in is connected from the source to ground, and V1 also appears between ground and the source. So V1 and V in are negative of each other. So we say V in is equal to minus V1, and uh, that means that GM V1 flowing this way is equal to minus GM times V in. So I will just do that. I will change the color of my pen and say this current is equal to minus GM V1. V1 is minus V in. GM, GM V1 or minus GM V in. So we have eliminated V1. Now we just write a KCL at the output node uh, saying that this current plus this current must be zero. And then this current is the voltage across RD divided by RD. So we say V out over RD minus GM times V in must be zero. That means that the voltage gain of the circuit is given by GM times RD. Very simple. It's very similar to the common source stage, except that it's a positive gain. The stage does not invert, as we saw qualitatively last time. OK, uh, that's good. We can remember that. Again, you just remember that this is under this condition. If lambda is not 0, it's a little more complicated. And we don't do that in this course. The next uh, quantity we need to find is the input resistance. So let's try to find that. R in. So, uh, for the input impedance, what do we do? Well, we take the circuit and put in a box. So here's our, our box. We set all independent sources to zero. So this becomes zero, this becomes zero. Then we come from outside, apply a voltage, measure the current. So here's how it goes. We have uh, this, we have the dependent current source GM V1. Then here we have V1. Uh, the gate is set to zero. The, drain, the supply is set to zero. And I'm coming from outside and applying Vx and measuring Ix. Of course, in this case, you see that these two are very similar. In the previous case, I just wanted to find V out over V in, whereas in this case, I want to find Vx over Ix. I'm not concerned with V out. OK, but the same condition holds in this circuit as well. Namely, V1 is equal to minus Vx. So that means that this current is equal to minus Gm times Vx. Now let's write the KCL at this node. Ix is going in, GMV1 is going in, there's no other current, so they have to add up to zero. So I write Ix, and GMV1 is minus GMVx, minus GMVx is equal to zero. So R in, which is Vx over Ix, is equal to one over GM. So the input impedance of a common source stage is 1 over Gm of the transistor, provided that channel X modulation is neglected. This is very different from what we saw for the common source stage. There, the input impedance was infinite, at least before we had added the biased devices. So this is very interesting. This impedance is actually considered relatively low. 1 over Gm is perhaps somewhere between 50 ohms, 100 ohms, a few hundred ohms in that range. So it's not a very high value. All right, so is there an application where a, an amplifier with a low input impedance would be useful or required? From our previous examples, like connecting a microphone to the amplifier, etc., our impression was that the input impedance must be as high as possible so that the signal from the microphone is not attenuated if the microphone itself has an internal resistance a 7 and resistance. 
But uh, here we have a low input impedance, so is that useful? And there are some applications. So I will show you one application of a situation like this, and that would be the case of a receiver, for example. So application. Remember our Bluetooth receiver? We said we have an antenna. So we have an antenna, and then we have a low noise amplifier, LNA. Now, when we connect an antenna to a low noise amplifier, for reasons that you might learn in electromagnetic courses, electromagnetic courses, uh, we require that the input resistance of the LNA are in be equal to the resistance of the antenna, this resistance. The antenna has a resistance, which we call R and. A typical value for the resistance of an antenna is 50 ohms. It's called radiation resistance. Again, that's something you have to learn in electromagnetics. So we would like to design an amplifier whose input impedance is about 50 ohms. And there you go. That's a good example because the input impedance of the common gate stage is 1 over GM. By proper choice of GM, I can create about 50 ohms. So that's one example of a common gate stage. So you could do something like this. It comes to the common gate stage. And uh, we have an amplifier here. We have a battery here. And we're good, right? So that would be the out. We take the signal from the, microphone, from the antenna. We amplify it and produce it at the output. And we choose this GM to give us 50 ohms looking this way. And then the antenna itself is 50 ohms. So we have uh, uh, this agreement. This is called matching, impedance matching between the antenna and the LNA. So that's one example of the use of a common gate stage. All right, so that's great. Uh, let me clean up uh, these lines here. Uh, in the next stage, let's go and take a look at the output impedance of the common gate circuit. So R out. The procedure is simple. Again, we set all independent sources in to zero, and we connect a, an AC small signal voltage source to the port of interest, in this case the output port, and measure the resulting current that gives us the output impedance. So here's what it is. We have our common gate stage. Uh, the voltage source connected here has to be set to zero because an independent source. So this is set to zero. So V in is set to zero. Uh, the battery voltage is set to zero, the supply voltage. This battery voltage is set to zero. Of course, we have to be careful. This is AC zero, meaning that the transistor has not turned off. So this is what sometimes we write AC ground to make sure that we don't confuse the situation. And uh, this is the output port. The output port consists of two nodes, this node and ground. So we come along and apply a voltage here and measure this current. OK. So the circuit of interest to us is this whole thing in the box. And we are interested in the impedance seen at that port. All right, well, do I need to draw the small signal model of the MOS device here? Well, maybe not. So I'm trying to see if I can reuse the, the, the analyses that I have performed in the past. Uh, in particular, let's rewind to when we studied the simple common source stage and found this output impedance. So let's draw that on the other side of the board. Remember what we did here. So we drew a common source stage like so. And again, we said, let's set the input source to zero. It's an independent source. So this is set to zero, again, AC ground. We set the battery voltage to zero. And then we came here, 
applied a voltage from outside Vx and measured Ix. That was the setup that we created to measure the output impedance of a common source stage. All right, now let's compare these two. We see that they are actually identical. How did that happen? Well, if we are trying to find the output impedance of a circuit, the input voltage is set to zero. That means that we may not even know where the input was, because in the calculation of the output impedance, the input port has disappeared. Here, the input port was at the source to ground. Here, the input port was from the, from the gate to ground. Uh, but because they were set to zero, this circuit and the circuit turned out to be identical. So the output impedance calculation doesn't know where the input was originally because we set the input to zero, whether it was a voltage source or a current source. And it just happens that the output port of the common gate stage and the output port of the common source stage have the same impedance. So we don't have to work anymore. We just remember the results here. Uh, for lambda equals zero, the result was that that was RD. So here is also RD. So we say uh, R out equals RD. Of course, you can draw the small signal model of the transistor, but that would be the same as what we drew before. So why do the work again? All right, that is the output impedance of the common gate stage. What we see is that it has a relatively low input impedance. The output impedance is moderate. RD can be some value from hundreds of ohms to some kilo ohms, perhaps. Uh, and those are the properties of the circuit with this much voltage gain. All right, let's go over an example to hammer these ideas in. So let's change the color to maybe this one. And we write, we draw a circuit. So let's draw a circuit like this. I have a comma source stage with the generation RD, RS with an input. We know how to analyze this. But now I come along and place another stage after this stage. Remember, sometimes we cascade stages perhaps because we would like to have a higher gain. So I come along and place a common gate stage after this stage, like so. Let's call this RD1, this RD2. And we, we have a battery or something here for the bias of the gate. This is, of course, our power supply, VDD, and then our main output is here, V out. And we call this M1, this M2, and we would like to find the voltage gain V out over V in. We say the gain from here to here. <coughs> okay, as usual, since we have a cascade of stages, we try to find the gain to some intermediate point and then from that intermediate point to the output. So we call this node X, and for small signals, we will say V out over V in is equal to V X over V in times V out over V X. We don't have to do it this way, but this simplifies things because we break a larger circuit into little pieces that can be analyzed using our prior knowledge of these circuits. All right, how much is Vx over V in? Vx over V in. That is the voltage gain of a degenerated common source stage. By the way, we are assuming lambda equals zero. Okay, well, I remember the wording for the gain of a common source stage with degeneration. We said it was equal to minus the impedance tied between the drain and AC ground, the drain and AC ground, divided by 1 over GM plus 
the impedance tied between the source and AC ground. So let's take our time and figure out what these are. So we're going to write for Vx over Vn. We have a minus here. And then we're looking for the total resistance or impedance tied between the drain of M1 and AC ground. Well, we have RD1 going to AC ground because VDD doesn't change with time. So that's fine. But is there anything else? We see that here, as we go this way, this is not infinity. This terminal draws some current, some signal current, some bias current, everything. So when there is signal, and we're trying to find the gain, uh, the current produced by M1, this small signal current produced by M1, does not entirely flow through RD1. We lose some of it this way to this guy. And we know how much of it we lose because we know the impedance looking this way. This is the impedance seen at the input of a common gate stage, which we just found to be 1 over GM. So, the total resistance tied between node X and AC ground consists of RD1 in parallel with another resistance from here to AC ground. And that resistance, as we determined before, by applying a voltage to ground and measuring the current, is equal to 1 over GM. So we have minus RD1 in parallel with 1 over GM2. These are in parallel. RD1 goes from the drain to AC ground. 1 over GM2 is the resistance that we measured between here and AC ground. That was the setup that we created. So that resistance is also seen between this terminal and AC ground. All right, how about the denominator? Well, that's just RS plus 1 over GM. So 1 over GM2, uh, GM1 plus the resistance tied between the source and AC ground, so that's RS. This takes care of Vx over V in. Now we go to V out over Vx. <coughs> v out over Vx, that's just the gain of a simple common gate stage with lambda equals zero. We know that is equal to Gm times Rd, so that's easy, we have Gm2 times Rd2. And this is the overall gain of the circuit. Now, had we drawn the small signal models of the two transistors and tried to solve everything, we would have eventually reached something like this, but perhaps even more complex. Because if we don't recognize that this is in parallel with this, imagine that with an equation where this is not nicely grouped like that, uh, you end up with this big equation, and you have no idea what means what. So that's why we want to build upon our, our prior knowledge and gradually use those results in analyzing more complex topologies. All right. Let's go on to uh, the <coughs> next important concept. And uh, I wanted to revisit the output resistance of a common gate stage in a special case. So this is a special case. So output resistance of uh, CG stage in a special case. All right, so here's the special circuit that I would like to consider. Imagine that we have a common gate stage, as usual, with all the stuff on it, RD, and uh, it is driven by a non-ideal voltage source. For example, a microphone, which has an internal resistance. So when I create the Thevenin equivalent of that source, let's say the microphone, it looks like this. It has some sort of voltage, but it also has some sort of resistance. We call this R mic or RS, whatever we like. In fact, even for the antenna situation, we have the same thing. This antenna 
can be modeled by a 7 and equivalent. And that 7 and equivalent will consist of one voltage source, something like this, and then an uh, output resistance, a uh, turbulent resistance, which would be equal to 50 ohms for the case of the antenna. Okay, so this is a realistic picture of any device that we want to connect to this common gate stage. All right. Now, I would like to find the output impedance of the circuit in this situation. So the source is not driven by an ideal voltage source. It is driven by something else, by a 7 and equivalent. Okay, so no problem. We go ahead and perform our usual procedure. We set all the independent sources to zero, and we apply voltage from outside, measure the current. So here's how it goes. And in fact, to make things interesting, let's assume that lambda is not zero. Okay, so we even include channel length modulation in this case. It's just a special case that would be interesting to analyze. Very well, so this is what we get. We set the input to zero. And this is an independent source, it goes to zero. We have uh, the seven and equivalent resistance of that device left over, so it has to be there. Then we have RD. And uh, then uh, we set this to zero. This is again AC zero, because the battery doesn't change with time. And the supply, of course, is AC zero. And now we come along and uh, perform our usual test. So we apply VX and measure IX. Okay, so this is a little circuit whose output impedance we need to find. It seems a little complicated because we have some resistance from here to ground and lambda is not zero. So does it mean that we have to draw the small signal model of the transistor? Well, not really. Uh, if you look at the circuit for a while, it actually looks familiar. All you need to do is just draw this transistor sideways, this way. If you move the gate from right to left, you can see that this is actually a common source stage with the generation. When we want to find the output impedance of a common source stage with the generation, what do we do? We set its input to zero, we set the supply to zero, and then we apply something to its output. The input is set to zero, the supply is set to zero, and that's, that's what it looks like. This emphasizes my previous point. When we're trying to find the output impedance of a circuit, we have lost information about where the input port is. The input port could be here, or the input port could be the gate. And by the time we drew it for output impedance calculations, we lost that information. So this circuit has an output impedance identical to that of a common source stage with the generation. And we know what that is, even with lambda not zero. So we're going to write it out from our previous knowledge. So what we remember is the following. Our out consists of two parallel components. One is RD, because RD goes from here to zero. So that's what we had before, RD. And then what we have is the impedance looking from the drain downward. So if I don't worry about RD, if I throw a RD, what do I have? I have a degenerated current source. And we know the output impedance of a degenerated current source. It's given by 1 plus GMRO times RS plus RO. So that is the output impedance of this particular common gate stage with lambda not equal to 0. The purpose of this example was, again, to show you that uh, we can apply our prior knowledge of these things and we don't have to perform the analysis over and over again. Very well. Let's uh, move on to uh, bias design. Now that we have understood the small signal properties of the common gate stage, we want to go ahead and bias it properly. 
we have a battery here, so we have to do something other than that battery. We probably know what to do. And then some other points that we have to consider. So let's go ahead and look at the bias situation. Okay, well here's the situation. We have a common gate stage. We need some voltage for the gate to keep it biased and we know that we can use a resistive divider just like the common source stage. So we take the battery, the supply voltage that we have, divide it down using a voltage divider, R1 and R2. That gives us the amount of voltage that we need. We connect it here. That, of course, is always a battery. Sometimes we show it, sometimes we don't show it. That's a battery called VDD. And then we have a resistor here. We have a transistor here. And that looks like uh, what we need. It seems that we have proper biasing. But uh, something interesting happens in this case. Let's assume that this amplifier is connected to an antenna, as I showed you just a moment ago. So I'm going to bring an antenna connected here and see if there's any problem. And this time I will find a different antenna. It just happens that I have found what I call a V antenna. Last time I showed you a loop antenna, this time I show a V antenna. All right, this is a perfectly legitimate antenna. I can use this to receive a signal, like a Bluetooth signal, and then apply it to this amplifier. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. This amplifier has two, this antenna has two uh, terminals. So these two terminals will be connected from here, from the input of the amplifier to ground. So let's do that. Do we have a problem? Well, you see this V antenna is an open circuit at DC. You see, we have a wire like this, a wire like this. These two wires are not connected. So even though this antenna is capable of generating a voltage signal at 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz, it has no connection between these two points for DC, for a bias current. So now what happens is that because it's an open circuit between here and here, even though I have connected the antenna, as far as the bias is, condition, bias is concerned, we cannot have any current going like this. This is an open circuit. That means that M1 has no current. It's off. Well, it might be on, but it has no current. So that's the problem. It has no current. If ID is zero, if you remember the transconductance is zero, the device is dead, we have no gain. All right, so what do we do in this case? We have a type of load like this that does not allow any bias current to flow through it, but we still need a bias current to flow from the power supply all the way down to ground. Well, we have to go and find some sort of two-terminal device that is capable of carrying a DC current. And we know the candidates for that, right? And not a capacitor. Capacitors cannot do that. But a resistor can do that, a current source can do that, or even an inductor can do that. These are capable of carrying, passing a constant current. So our first reaction would be just to use the resistor. So we use the resistor between here and here, and then if we want to connect our antenna, our V antenna, we can do that, use our V antenna. So now the V antenna is open for DC calculations, for bias calculations, and the current for bias calculations flows like so and goes to ground. And that allows us to bias M1 properly. And when the signal comes in, the signal creates some voltage on top of the DC voltage, and it gets amplified and comes out and so forth. So that's why the source of the common, uh, common gate stage has to be connected to ground through some conductive device for DC purposes. All right, so that's the basic structure of a common gate stage with biasing. We have a resistor here, resistor here, resistor divider here, right? And that's the, what it boils down to. Okay, so, but adding this RS here does cause some problems. 
So let me show you what happens. Well, this antenna is not an ideal voltage source. For example, it has a 50 ohm Thevenin resistance. So if I model the antenna by a Thevenin equivalent, this is what, what happens. In fact, because I don't want to draw all that circuitry again, uh, let me, or, okay, I'll, that's okay, I'll draw it again. So let's draw the Thevenin of the antenna. We'll write it like this. We say V ant and R ant. This is the Thevenin equivalent of the antenna. This value might be 50 ohms. And then this goes and connects to the rest of the circuit. So here's the rest of the circuit, RS. Then we have our, our MOSFET. And then we have uh, our bias, etc. So we'll just call this V0 for now. OK, so now something happens. The antenna generates a voltage. The voltage generates a current through this resistor. So a current starts coming in. Let's call that I antenna, I ant. This current comes in. This is the signal current. This is the useful current that we would like to process and amplify, etc. Now this current reaches this point and splits. Some of it goes this way, call it I1. Some of it goes this way, call that I2. And we know one of these is undesirable. The current that flows through RS is undesirable. We were hoping that all of this current will go through the common gate stage and be come out and so on, right? But we are losing some of it to RS. So that's the problem with introducing RS for bias purposes. We tend to lose some of the signal. Uh, so how do we make sure that the loss of the signal is negligible? Well, we are hoping that the current that flows this way is much greater than the current that flows this way. Let's say 10 times, roughly. That means that maybe I should make this impedance 10 times bigger than this impedance, because the current always prefers to go through the least resistive path. So you might remember that the current division between two impedances is given by, for example, I1 is equal to, the current that flows this way, is equal to the other impedance, Rs. There are two impedances in parallel here, right? Rs going from here to ground, and then looking into here, we see 1 over Gm. So we have to split the current between Rs and 1 over Gm. And the current through 1 over Gm would be Rs over Rs plus 1 over Gm times the incoming current, I ant. So this tells us to maximize I1, we have to maximize RS. For example, RS has to be uh, much greater than 1 over GM, so that this is about 1. So in designing circuit, we should strive to satisfy this condition. As, well, as I will show you later, it may not be possible, really, but at least that's the goal. All right, so that is the situation when we introduce this RS. Uh, in some more advanced courses, you might learn that we might use a current source instead of RS because the current source has a higher impedance. And that helps us, right, because we want to maximize RS here. But in this course, we don't worry about that. Very well. Uh, based on this, uh, we uh, just need to do one more thing before we go through an example. So let me uh, clean this up a, a little here. So let's go back here. I will draw the antenna like so. And then I have a resistor RD. And this is V out, as usual. OK, so these two circuits are separate. All right. Now, we know that this current splits and so forth. But ultimately, what we are really interested in is V out over this voltage V ant, and the small signal gain from this voltage to that output. So how do we calculate that voltage gain in the circuit? This is not quite 
the common gates that we studied before. Before, this voltage source was directly connected to the source terminal, and we found the gain to be GMRD. But now, that's not the case. There's another resistor here, there's another resistor here. So, assuming that lambda is zero, we would like to find the voltage gain from here to here. And that's the quiz of today. I will give you 90 seconds to think about it. Okay, so how did you approach this problem? Well, we can look at it as a, like a cascade of stages. In other words, we can call this node x and then try to find vx over v in, v out over vx, and then multiply them, right? So let me change the color of my pen and see what we get. Okay, so we write as usual v out over v ant is equal to v x over v ant times v out over v x. Well, let's try to find v x over v ant. This voltage over this voltage. Well, we recognize a voltage divider here. This voltage divider consists of a series resistor equal to R amp, and then some resistance tied from here to ground. Uh, that's not just RS though. The resistance that we see from here to ground consists of RS, and then something else, because this terminal draws a current to ground, and that's one over GM. So if I were to uh, draw an equivalent circuit for this part, it would be something like this. It would be like this, RS, uh, sorry, R ant, RS, and then what we see into the common gate stage is 1 over GM, and then we have V ant. So this tells us that the voltage division from V and to V X must include the effect of this one over GM. In other words, this one over GM is parallel to R S, and then this combination and R and give us certain voltage division. So what we have is a one over GM in parallel with R S divided by R and plus one over GM in parallel with RS. That is the voltage gain or attenuation from here to here, from here to here. And now we can find V out over VX, which is just a gain of a simple common gate stage, GMRD. So that's GMRD. This is the overall voltage gain from the antenna signal to the output, including the thermal resistance of the antenna and the effect of this RS here. Very well. So we are uh, done with bias design. 
Now we're going to go over an example to see how, how, how all, of these, all of these ideas come together. So let's look at an example. I would like to design this common gauge stage with the following parameters. A supply voltage of 1.5 volts, a power budget of uh, 1.5 milliwatts, uh, then uh, with mu n c aux of the transistor equal to 100 microamps per volt squared, threshold voltage equals 0.5 volts, 0.5 volts, and what else did I assume? Uh, lambda is zero. Okay, and we would like to design the circuit. Uh, I also W over L is 50. All right. So we go ahead with these uh, parameters, calculate this, uh, design the circuit, bias it up, etc., and then see what kind of gain we get. Right. See if the gain is reasonable or not. If not, then we have to come back and see which one of these parameters we have to change or compromise. Okay, so we start out with the power budget and the supply voltage. If we have 1.5 volts from here to here, and the total power budget must be 1.5 milliwatts, then the current, the supply bias current that we can draw is 1 milliamp, right? 1 milliamp times 1.5 volts is 1.5 milliwatts. So the total current we have av available is 1 milliamp. Now I'm assuming that this current is very small. So I'm assuming that that 1 milliamp mostly flows through the device itself. So let's assume that ID itself is approximately equal to 1 milliamp. OK, so that's not bad. Now we go ahead and calculate various parameters, starting with uh, VGS. So we know that ID is equal to one half of mu n C aux W over L VGS minus VTH squared. We are giving one milliamp to the transistor with a mu n C aux of 100 microamps per volt squared. W over L is 50. VTH is 0.5, so we can find VGS, the amount of voltage necessary from here to here. So you plug in the numbers and VGS is equal to 0.63 volts. All right, so far so good. Now, in addition to that, we can go ahead and calculate GM, right? We have three equations for GM. We can use whichever you like. Maybe I'll just say 2ID over VGS minus VTH. And that's equal to this, we have 0.63, and then 2 ID is 2 milliamps. Uh, that gives us a GM of 3.2 millisiemens, or equivalently 1 over 316 ohms. All right, so uh, good. We have uh, some parameters of the device. Uh, now we need to go and choose, for example, RS and then RD. All right, remember the recommendation before. We said to make sure that the current coming from uh, this uh, realistic picture uh, mostly flows through the MOS device, we would like to make this resistor as large as possible. So maybe 10 times 1 over GM. So should I do that? Should I choose RS is equal to 10 times 1 over GM? So that would be 3.16 kilo ohms. Well, I would like to do that, but unfortunately I cannot. The problem is that if this resistor is 3.16 kilo ohms, and the bias current of this transistor is 1 milliamp, then the voltage from here to here is 3.16 volts, well above the total supply voltage that we have, which is only 1.5 volts. So we're stuck. We can't do that. All right, so what can we do? Well, 
let's see how much voltage we, are, we have available for RS, just for bias purposes. Okay, well, we have already consumed some VGS here. That VGS is 0.63 volts. The best I can do is place this gate at VDD as high as possible. So I start from 1.5 volts, subtract 0.63, and whatever is left, I give to RS. That's the best I can do. So let's do that. So we say RS max is equal to VDD, if the gate is at VDD, minus 0.63 volts, which is the VGS of the device, divided by 1 milliamp. Right? And that gives us something like 370 ohms. So interestingly, in this case, RS is comparable to 1 over GM, right? 1 over GM and RS are about the same. So that means that we lose some of the signal. We lose about half of the signal to RS because RS and 1 over GM are quite comparable. But that's a fact of life. Nothing we can do about it because our power supply is limited to 1.5 volts. If I had a 5 volt supply, it would be a different story. But with a realistic, uh, modern-day power supply of 1.5 volts, that's what I end up with. Okay, so let's live with that for now. Uh, let's go ahead and find RD. This is where we are so far. We decided that uh, with a supply of 1.5 volts, we connected the gate to as positive a voltage as we can. So we connected it to VDD. So we don't even need a resistive divider because we decided that the gate should be as high as possible. And that allowed us to draw up about 370 millivolts across RS, and that gave us 370 ohms for RS. So 370 ohms. This is uh, the signal is coming from outside. Okay, and now we have to figure out what goes here. This RD. Well, we know that the gain of the circuit, at least from here to here, is GM times RD. So we have a certain GM, or it's already fixed, we have this much GM. So we have to maximize RD to maximize the voltage gain. The question is, how far can RD go? Well, what we know is that the voltage drop from here to here is equal to ID times RD. ID is one milliamp. So this voltage drop has to be such that this device doesn't go into triode region. And that's not that hard to figure out. The gate is at 1.5 volts. The drain can be lower than the gate by as much as one threshold before we reach the edge of saturation and triode. So this is at 1.5 volts. This can be lower by one threshold. The threshold is 0.5 volts. So the voltage from here to here, from here to here, can be as much as 0.5 volts. So in this implementation, ID times RD must be uh, great, less than or equal to VTH so that for M1 to be in a saturation, in a saturation, so this pen is uh, going crazy again. <coughs> And uh, uh, so uh, RD has to be equal to 500 ohms, 0.5 volts and 1 milliamp. All right, we're, we're limited to that. If RD is larger, this voltage will be too low, the device will be in triad region. So that's, that's what we have to choose. Okay, how much GMRD do we get? The GMRD is now equal to 500 ohms over 316 ohms, uh, that's like 1.6. So the voltage gain is not a whole lot. And it just comes out of all these things that we have. We are limited by all of these parameters, the supply voltage, the power budget, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's the situation in this case. Okay, so let's say that your boss says, I'm not happy with this gain. This is too low. Can we give you more gain? 
And you go back and say, well, what can I compromise? And the boss says, well, I don't want to give you more power. So you have to keep this power the same. That means that this current is the same. All right. So then what can we play with? We have only W over L to play with, right? So, okay, maybe I can increase W over L because I know that if I increase W over L, GM goes up. GM goes up, maybe the situation gets better. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's, as an example, go ahead and double W over L. So from 50 to 100. So we'll go and do that and see what happens. We're just exploring, right? We'll see what happens. So, oh, I didn't change the color of my pen. All right. So uh, what if we double W over L? Okay. So W over L is 100. And that means, for example, the device is 0.1 micron long, and then it, it is 10 microns wide. 10 over 0.1 is 100. Of course, when the device is doubled in width, you can see that its capacitances also go up. I remember there's a capacitance between the gate and the channel, that's C aux and all that. So the capacitance goes up. So we expect that if we increase W over L, only, uh, the circuit probably will be slower than previously. Uh, that's something that we study in future courses, but that's the trade-off that we are making. We're hoping that GM will go up, etc., but we, we are also thinking that the circuit will be slower because the larger device has greater capacitances associated with it. Very well, so W over L is 100. Let's go back and recalculate everything. We start from here. Uh, ID is known. Uh, w over L is known. We need to find the new VGS. So the new VGS comes out to be, uh, according to my calculations, <coughs> let's see, 0 0.947. Uh, let's see. 0.947. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so let me make a quick uh, correction here. So this VGS is actually, um, this is VGS minus VTH. So the VGS in this case was 1.4. 1, 3 volts, uh, but the re other results are correct, 370 ohms here. Uh, now, the, this new VGS will be 0.95 volts. Obviously lower, when we make the device wider and the current is fixed, the VGS will go down. So this became wider, VGS went down uh, from this value to this value. All right. Uh, that means that uh, from here to here, I have 0.95 volts now. And that means that I have more voltage to drop across RS. Previously, VGS was 1.13. Now it's gone down. So as a result, RS can go up. So again, RS, the same equation as before, is equal to VDD minus VGS divided by ID. And because VG is smaller, RS can be larger. And the new RS will be 550 ohms. So that's good. We want RS to be as large as possible. Now, because we have a larger W over L, we also have a greater transconductance. So GM, again from the same equation, 2 milliamps over this, which is smaller now, uh, gives us 4.5 millisiemens, which is equivalent to 1 over 220 ohms. And this is good news because now the signal coming in here sees 220 ohms into the transistor and 550 ohms looking down. 
So more of the current prefers to go to the uh, amplifier, to the transistor, than to RS. Whereas previously, these two were about the same, 316 ohms and 370 ohms. So the situation is more favorable. And, of course, GMRD goes up. Because GM has gone up, RD doesn't change. So GMRD now is equal to, uh, let's see, 2.3. So the voltage gain is a little higher than before. So these are the trade-offs that we can make in the design of these circuits, playing with W over L, the bias current, etc. If we have a power budget, then the bias current may not be much negotiable. Uh, what we end up with is W over L. All right, this uh, concludes uh, our study of uh, the common gate stage, and uh, our time is up. Uh, next time we will go to another type of stage called the source follower. I will see you next time.